we welcome you this morning in the name of the Lord, and we trust that you've had a great week. Some of you may have had a disappointing week, understandable. Uh, you can read, you can read my lips, you can read between the lines. Uh, but uh, we're here, and uh, uh, God is God is with us. Uh, I, I want to. Uh, I want you to read a verse of scripture this morning. It's profound. It's so deep. It says, Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding of Isaiah 40? Father, we pray this morning as we commit this service to you. We pray, Father, you would exalt and honor your word, your truth, we pray, Father God, that we would understand, O oh Lord God, and, and certainly we don't understand or fathom your spirit and how your spirit moves and how your spirit works, but we're so thankful that you have given us your Holy Spirit to teach us, to train us, to instruct us. And Lord, we could never instruct you for you are everlasting, you are wise, uh, you are infinite, uh, you know all things. And who are we, O oh Lord, to teach you and instruct you and enlighten you? And, and Lord, uh, we pray this morning that you would come and you would be our teacher. You would enlighten us. You would be the one that would give us knowledge, understanding, wisdom, O oh Lord God. And so we pray that you would just move mightily this morning in our midst. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this morning we have a special for you, and I trust that you will uh, enjoy a mom-daughter special. So Cheryl and Michelle. Worship with us this morning as we sing praise to God.
trust that you've enjoyed that special, and uh, hopefully we can have other specials. If you have hidden talents out there, uh, let us know. Uh, we would love to have you do a special. We want to welcome the people that are online, and uh, if you're out there and you're online and you have special <coughs> abilities, uh, let us know. We would love to put you uh, put you to work. This morning, I want to continue with the sermon that I started last week. The sovereignty of God. We talked about God being in control. God being in charge. The scripture says the Lord has established his throne in the heavens. His kingdom rules over all. So if the Lord has established his throne, he must be a king. If he has a throne and he rules in the heavens, then he must have a kingdom. And he has a kingdom and his kingdom is on earth. And there are other forces at work there's the kingdom of God ruling over all, but there's an opposing kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. And that's why we see so much evil. I think that's why we even see the reign and the rule and the triumph of evil in these last days. Sometimes that's pretty scary. I don't know how many people are uh, gripped by the fear of the COVID virus. I, I don't know how many people talk about how the times are dark. And when you begin to think about that, that's pretty scary. So in light of that, I want to bring out the biblical truth, the, the truth from the scriptures, that God is sovereign, that God is the one who controls that's what I tried to impress upon your minds and your hearts last week. God is sovereign. He rules. He governs. He controls. But this morning what I want to do is I want to show you how God is sovereign over every aspect of life. And that would be his creation, the animal world, of the nations, mankind, angels, good and bad, uh, sovereign over evil, sovereign over the times and the leaders and, and seasons, and sovereign over history. And we'll conclude that he's sovereign even over salvation. Who gets saved and who doesn't get saved? I know these things are hard to understand. So I want to be brief in all of these categories. So let's take a look at the first one. That God is sovereign over his creation. By virtue of the fact that he is the creator. He made everything. And by design, he rules. And he certainly rules over his creation. Look what Isaiah 40 says. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hands and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains on a scale and the hills in a balance. This is a loaded phrase, but it talks about the waters and it talks about the heavens. It talks about the dust of the earth or, or the earth. It talks about the mountains, the hills. And it talks about God's creation. And notice what it says about the waters. Who is it who has measured all the ocean, put all the waters in the hollow of your hand? And this is a, an imagery that God holds the waters in the hollow of his hands. Can you do that? God has, but we can't. Who is it that has marked up the heavens 
with a span. A span was uh, from your fingertip over here, your middle finger, all the way to your thumb, and usually it's about eight inches. And who is it who can look at the heavens and say, I've measured the heavens? Only God. No one else. Who has taken off the dirt and, and, and the ground and, and the mountains and the hills and put them all on a scale and weighed them? Not us. But God has. And so it's a picture that God is sovereign over his creation. To whom will you compare me? And who is my equal? Says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes, he said, and look to the heavens. Ever been on a, on a beautiful night and the stars are out and you lift up your eyes. And God is the one who said, lift up your eyes, look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each one by name because of his great and mighty strength. Not one of them is missing. And you think of every star. God has a name for that particular star. He upholds it by the power and the might and the strength. And God is the one who is in control even over all creation. In fact, God is in control over every atom that exists because he created it. Look what Psalm 135, verse 6 and 7 says. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the deeps. It is he who makes the clouds rise from the end of the earth. And notice what that verse of scripture is saying, that God is pleased to work. And God does everything with his pleasure. Everything that God does is because God is pleased to do it, and he does it. Whether it's in the heavens or on the earth, in the seas, in the ocean, in the deeps, he makes the clouds to rise from the end of the earth. Look what else he does. He makes the lightning for the rain. And he brings forth the wind from his storehouses. The Lord says, I form light, I create darkness. I make well-being or shalom or, or peace or, or prosperity, depending on what version you're using. But the word is shalom, that inner peace. But I also create calamity. And those who reject it and how they, they suffer tension and, and apprehension and anxiety in their lives. I am the Lord who does all these things. He wraps up the waters in his clouds. And yet the clouds do not burst under their weight. He controls the waters. He controls the clouds. He covers the face of the full moon, spreading his clouds over it. He covers the, the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain and makes the grass to grow on the hills. Can you do that? Can you make the grass to grow? You can water it, fertilize it, take the weeds out. But you can't make it grow. You can't make the trees grow and blossom. God does. Because he's creator. He is sovereign. Psalm 148 says, Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures, and all the ocean death, depths, lightning and hail and snow and clouds, stormy winds. Now notice this. That do his bidding. Everything in creation is ordained and orchestrated and engineered for his plans and his purpose, and they do his bidding. 
the rain, the snow, everything, the storms, the mountains, the hills, the fruit trees, all the cedars, even the wild animals and all the cattle, the small creatures, the flying birds. Everything that God has created is under the sovereignty of God. And that includes kings. Look what he said. Kings of the earth and all nations. You princes and all rulers on the earth. Young men and women, maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. And I think what the psalmist is saying is, is that if you're hearing this, that our responsibility is to begin to praise Him because God is sovereign. God is in control over everything. There's nothing that He's not in control of. If He isn't, He isn't God. But by the fact that He's the creator of the heavens and the earth, and he's established everything for his plan. And everything, and, and I don't have time, but everything, there's a plan and a purpose for the grass, for the animals to eat and to enjoy. And God is sovereign even over the animals. When you think of the animal world and, and how diverse and how beautiful, that God is even sovereign over the animals. When you think of what what God did through Balaam and, and his rebellion. And God spoke through a donkey, a talking donkey. The donkey spoke. Hard to believe. But God is the one who was behind that to bring Balaam to repentance. Or what about Elijah who was fed morning and night? This raven that's a carnivorous animal would have meat in its beak and bring it to feed Elijah. Talk about providence. We'll talk about providence next week. But God is the one who commands the ravens and they feed them in the morning. God even uses the water from the brook to supply for Elijah's physical thirst. Or think of the angels, for example, that shut the mouths of the lions when Daniel refuses to bow down to the governing authorities. And he's thrown into the lion's den. God commanded the angel to shut the mouths of the lions. Or think of the fish that God ordained and, and created and appointed to swallow Jonah and bring him to his appointed destiny because Jonah was running in the opposite direction. Or think of Jesus when he's confronted with whether he pays taxes or not. He tells Peter, he says, I want you to go by, cast out your line, and the first fish that you catch, you'll find a four drachma coin there. Take it to the authorities. Pay your tax, pay my tax. And I want to tell you that I think in practical application, don't worry about your taxes. Don't complain about your taxes. And we're going to see more and more taxes going to happen. But if you know Jesus and you understand that God is sovereign, in his sovereignty, he will provide. You just praise him. God will provide your taxes for you so you can pay. But notice the sovereignty of God in the animal world. Notice the sovereignty of God amongst the nations. Think of all the nations that exist. God is sovereign over them. Isaiah 40 says, Behold the nations. Look how God sees the nations. Behold, the nations are like a, a drop in a bucket. Imagine a bucket empty, but all you see is one little drop. And from God's point of view, that's all the nations are like a drop in a bucket. And all the nations are like the dust, but the dust on a scale. And all the nations are like, like the coastland, all the dust you can take it. Because God is sovereign. Verse 
verse 17, he says, all the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. Don't you know? Haven't you heard? Hasn't it been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? Go back to the creation. Meditate, focus on the creation, but listen and understand. He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. Its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught or nothing. And he reduces, notice this, he reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them. And they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like the chaff. Look what he says about the kings, the leaders of the world. The kings of the earth, they set themselves and and the rulers, they take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast them away from their cord. It's Hebrew expression. That means that we will rebel against God. We don't want God. We want nothing to do God. God will not rule over us. But look what it says. He who sits in the heavens <clears throat>, laughs. The Lord holds them in derision, in confusion. Look what we did. Look what he did to the Tower of Babel. God is still doing that to this day concerning the kings of the earth. Psalm 33 says, The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. And that includes not only when God spoke these things, but they continue, that God continued to frustrate the counsel of the ungodly because he is sovereign. When you think of the kings or the rulers of the earth, the scripture says in Revelation 16, for they are spirits of demons performing signs, look, look at this, which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole earth <clears throat> to gather them for that great day of almighty God. God has a plan, and God has a purpose, even in allowing evil. Allowing evil people to reign and to rule. That's why I call it the season and the times of evil. And it's like evil has come upon us. But it's all for a purpose. God is gathering and putting everything in motion and all the plan for that final great battle when the leaders of this world are going to rebel against God. On that great battle on the day of Armageddon. Look what it says. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich, commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, they hid themselves in the caves and on the rocks of the mountain. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Don't be fooled. God is not mocked. God knows exactly what is happening in the earth today, even though we don't seem to understand it, even though we seem to be disappointed in the events that have happened recently. God is sovereign, and God is in control. He's sovereign over all, over all of mankind, his own people. Look what he did to Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. He appeared with them in the fire. 
And if we go through the fire as well, he will be with us. Jesus will be with us every step of the way. There is no place that God cannot be. And wherever you're at, even in the face of evil, he is right there with you. Look what Proverbs 15, 3 says. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Proverbs 15, 11. Sheol and Abaddon. Uh, Sheol was, and Abaddon was a place of destruction. It's, it's hell, a place of death and darkness. Look what it says. It lies open before the Lord. How much more the hearts of the children of man. God knows exactly what is on our heart. He knows our actions as well. He knows the heart of every person in this world. Why? He created them. He made them. He's sovereign. He's the ruler. He is in control. Look what Proverbs 15, 25 says. The Lord tears down the house of the proud. And be sure this is going to happen. The proud and the wicked, God is going to tear down. We're not talking literally here. We're talking about God is going to bring calamity and destruction to evildoers. But he maintains the widow's boundary. Proverbs 20, 24 says, A man's steps are of the Lord. It doesn't say Christians or unbelief. It says a man, a person, everyone, their steps. They're ordained from God. From beginning to life to the end of day, everything in our lives is appointed by God. How can we even understand our own ways? And how do, how do we become so confused? Uh, I'm so confused in my mind and my thinking. I better go see a shrink and, and maybe he can straighten me out. Uh, you can't understand what's happening in this world. Unless you see and you understand that God is sovereign, God is in control. He's also in control of the angel world. All the angels that he's created. Look at the good angels concerning them. When Jesus was born, he said, let all God's angels worship him. And no wonder they appeared and say, today I bring you good news of great joy. The Savior is born. And all the heaven and the glory of Almighty God. God appointed them to give praises to his son. He makes his angels spirits, his servants fire, flames of fire. Look what verse 14 says. Are not all angels ministering spirits? They minister. They're ministering their spirits. They, they're sent. God sends them to serve those who will inherit salvation. God has appointed the angels over you and me. And we're not alone. And God says, I'm commanding them to watch over you, to guard you, to take care of you, to protect you. So we have nothing to fear. Look at the demonic world. When Jesus came, he was constantly rebuking evil, demonic, unclean spirits. And when he did that, look what Mark 1.27 says. The people were also amazed, and they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority, he even gives orders to impure, or unclean spirits. He gives orders. And they obey him. The demonic world, the world of evil, as we know, is under the marching orders of Almighty God, and God controls them. That's why the A.W. King says these words. He said, some angels are higher in rank than others. Some are more powerful than others. Some are nearer to God than others. The scripture reveals a definite and a well-defined gradation in the angelic orders. Archangels, seraphims, cherubims, all the way. There's an order in heaven amongst all God's angels, what the Bible calls the elect angels. 
But there's also an order in the demonic world from principalities and powers and powers and rulers in forces of evil that are at work. Martin Luther in his great hymn of the faith says this, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear. You better fear if you focus on the demonic world. He says, but we will not fear. Why? For God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure. Listen, for lo, his doom is sure. Amen. One little word shall fell him. A mighty fortress is our God. Amen. God is sovereign over angelic world, but he's also sovereign over evil. When you think of evil for a moment, uh, when you think when evil people do evil things, God is still sovereign. God is still in control. It's not as if God has lost all control and the world of evil is taking over the world of God, the kingdom of God. Don't have time this morning, but one of these days, the story of Joseph is, is an amazing lesson how the brothers were evil and there was malice and hatred. They hated Joseph. They wanted to kill him. They sold him, betrayed him for money. But God used him, and God raised up Joseph to be the next, uh, next to the, the ruler of the king. And God had a plan and a purpose for everything that happens in the lives of Joseph, even though he spent 13 years in, in prison. And we say, how unjust, how unfair. God puts everything together for his plans and his purposes. Look what Revelation 17 says. 17 says, I find great comfort in this verse of scripture. For God has put it into their hearts, the evil rulers, he's put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose. By agreeing to hand over the beasts, their royal authority, until God's words are fulfilled. Even the Antichrist is under the control of Almighty God in His sovereignty. And God has put it in their hearts to rise up against Him. And we know what happens in that great day of Armageddon when all the kings of the earth gather together to overthrow the Lamb. And if you don't know what happens, you better read the book of Revelation until the words of God are fulfilled. God has not lost control. Evil doesn't have the upper hand upon God. Remember what Isaiah 46 says. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no, no other. I am God and there is no one, none like me. I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient time things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish my purpose. Nothing can frustrate the plans and the purposes of God. When Nebuchadnezzar was a proud, arrogant ruler, repented, this is what he says as he confessed to the rulership and the sovereignty of God. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. The rule, the control of God. It was God that had given Nebuchadnezzar his kingdom. And he says, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and amongst the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? But that's what we do. We don't understand the time. We don't understand what God is doing. He said, God, what are you doing? 
You better listen to my plan because my plan is better than yours. I don't know how many times I've said that to the Lord. But I do. I think I know better than God. And that makes me sovereign. But in scriptures like this, it says, I'm not. God is sovereign. And I don't understand the plans of God. But all I know is that there's a plan and a purpose for everything. There's a time and a season for every activity in heaven and on earth. He changes the seasons. He changes the times and the leaders. Look what the scripture says. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. For wisdom and power belong to him. Notice this. He changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and establishes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness. And light dwells with him. God is sovereign over everything. And, you know, as we are in winter, it is God that's going to change into spring. And God is everything set in motion. And he controls everything by the word of his power. Even natural disasters. And we've seen many of them. And we're going to see more. Listen to what Job says. The breath of God produces ice. And the broad waters become frozen. He loads the clouds with moisture. He scatters his lightning through them. At his direction, they swirl around over the face of the whole earth to do whatever he commands them. He brings the clouds to punish people or waters to his earth to show his love. And I think that deep, if I could extrapolate an implication, is that God allows the natural disaster that we don't understand them. And we question God. But look what he said. To one, it is to punish people. To another, it is to show that he loves them in protecting them to those natural disasters. Jack Sin, what a name, what a last name like Sin. Okay, can you imagine that having a name like sin? Okay, but Jack here, okay, says this. God allows personal calamities to humble the arrogant pride of man and to awaken and bring him back to the Lord in repentance. I believe that. That God allows these natural disasters and because God is sovereign over everything, even over history. We're told that in history, we looked at this last week, over his people, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, even up to Rome. And he used everything for his plan and purpose. In the last 2,000 years, God has been ruling over the last 2,000 years so that everything culminates for his great and final appointed day of the wrath of the Lamb upon those who are so arrogant and proud and evil and they rebel against God. And even in America, God has been sovereign and God is still sovereign. Even though we don't see the tide of the time go in the direction that we think it ought to go. But God is still sovereign over America. Somebody said that the events of world history have been sovereignly arranged by God for him to carry out his purpose. For Jesus to come back again, the day of our, the great day of Armageddon must happen. And God is raising up the world leaders for that particular plan and purpose. When you look at history for a moment, God used the Greeks and united the people with one Greek language for the world to have one common language, really a reversal of um, the Tower of Babel. Thank you. Look what he did to the Roman Empire. They built roads all over so that the gospel could spread all over the world. And as it began to spread to Germany and with the inventing of the printing press, 
Uh, the word was put in, 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 in print in the languages of the common people. And the Catholic Church rebelled because they thought that only the word should be in Latin and keep the common people in darkness. But God knew what exactly what he was doing with the German Reformation and the British and the Scottish Reformation and, and God raising up the British with a world fleet. Why? To come to America. That the gospel would come to America. And the gospel has come to America. And we could say for the last 200 years, God's grace has been in America. And the gospel has been spreading all over the world. And Americans have sent many, many missionaries all over the world for God's plans and purposes. But now, I believe God has allowed in his sovereignty to harden the hearts of America. And America has now turned its back on God. You think of what the uh, uh, present president has just done this week that is pure evil in signing 17 of those uh, executive orders. Evil. But God is allowing it for plans and purposes and I believe is heading to the day of Armageddon. Listen to what the scripture says. The God who made the world and everything in it, he's the Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples built by hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives life and breath and everything else. From one man, that is from Adam, from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. Listen to this. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God has ordained, ordered, and planned everything so that everything would culminate in our salvation very quickly, very briefly. I don't have time to really uh, develop that. But God is sovereign even in salvation. God used evil to bring about good. Uh, Peter says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus, listen carefully, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and you killed by the hands of lawless men. It was all planned. It was all planned for Jesus to come, for Jesus to be arrested. For Jesus to be tried and condemned by evil, wicked people, by Herod, by Pilate, by the Jews, all planned. It was probably the greatest evil that ever happened in the world. Because Jesus never sinned. And everything that Jesus did was good. And it went about healing and bring about life. And, and, and he, would, he would just begin to touch the people. But they took him and they arrested him. It was all planned. Look, look what Isaiah 53 says. It was the Lord's will to crush him, to cause him to suffer. How could God do that? Because God took your sins, my sins, upon Jesus. And he punished Jesus instead of punish, punishing all of us. What a brilliant, marvelous wise plan that God would punish his son instead of us so that we could be forgiven and after he had suffered he would see the light of life that not only would he suffer and die but he would be raised to life again all part of the plans of God and no wonder Jesus said that this is the hour that evil reigns because Satan was using evil people, the Jews and, 
and the, the Pharisees and, and the Romans and all of them to fulfill the plans of God. Look what Acts chapter 4 says. They, they're arrested and they're released. They go back and this is their prayer. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Look how they call them. Sovereign God. Sovereign Lord. You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Do we pray like that? You spoke by the Holy Spirit through your mouth, the mouth of your servant, our father David. Look what verse 27 says. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate, they met together with the Gentiles and all the people of Israel in this city. Listen, to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. But look at verse 28 says. They did what your power and will decided beforehand should happen. God is sovereign. And there's no wisdom. There's no understanding. There's no insight. No counsel that can succeed or avail against God. The horse can be made ready for battle, but victory comes from the Lord. Somebody once said, God's timing is never early, it's never late. In fact, from before our birth until the moment that we breathe our last earthly breath, our sovereign God is accomplishing His divine purposes in our lives. Very quickly, how do you apply this? Well, if you read Isaiah 40, it gives you great comfort to know that God is sovereign. He's in control when it seems that the whole world is out of control. It gives us confidence that God is on our side. God is working for us. And it gives us courage to keep on moving on, to keep working for the Lord so that we don't become in despair. Give up. The rest of the world is in fear, in depression, in anxiety. They don't understand God is sovereign. It gives us comfort and confidence and courage. Keep going. Listen to what Spurgeon says as I conclude. He says this. When you go through a trial, realize that God is sovereign. Okay? But when you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow on which you lay your head. From the time that you get up in the morning to the time that you can go to bed at night, you can take comfort and confidence and courage in the fact that God is sovereign. He's in control. He's sovereign. He's in control. He rules everything he's created. He governs everything. Make no mistake. You're going to hear this phrase many, many times in the days ahead. Make no mistake. Well, I tell you, make no mistake. God is sovereign. God orders everything. He controls everything. He rules over everything. And that's why it can give us comfort and confidence and courage. And may you begin to just begin to understand, pray, pray. Who has given uh, insight to the Lord? None. But God can give us wisdom. To understand his ways, God is still on the throne in everything. And when you don't seem to understand it, don't blame God or charge God with injustice. You say, what are you doing you say, Lord, I'm just a humble person. I don't have the mind to comprehend and fathom what your spirit is doing. But one thing I know, you're in control, and I will trust you. If you're here this morning, may I encourage you to place your faith, your trust, in Almighty God, through his Son, Jesus Christ. Because look what Jesus did for you. Shall we pray? Our Father God, this morning, 
We just pray that you would help us to understand. Father, only you could burn these truths in our hearts. That you are sovereign. You're in control. And you do everything that is good. And you've said, oh Lord, that, that God works everything for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Even though sometimes we interpret them as evil. Help us to see as you see. Help us to be wise with the wisdom that you would give us. And Father, in the days ahead that we don't see and understand Father, forgive us if we're quick to criticize and judge even evil for your words as they carry out your plans. Spirit of God, bless and honor your word this morning. For you are sovereign. In Jesus' name, amen. While they're coming up with a closing hymn, let me just encourage you online. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart, ask him today. Ask him to forgive you. Remember what Jesus did for you. He died on the cross so that you could be forgiven and have eternal life. If you're here this morning in this audience, you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart. Ask him, say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Come into my heart. From this moment on, I want to live by faith in you. Our closing hymn this morning is on 409. We did know. It's like, I know who I am to be. Let's rise together as we sing hymn number 409.
say thank you. Thank you for meeting with us. Thank you for instructing us. Thank you for working in our minds this morning to give us a glimpse of your sovereignty. You're in control. You rule. You govern. You even appoint the affairs of men unto their appointed day. But in these last days, O oh God, we pray that you sustain and watch over each and every one of us this morning. Guard us. Keep us. Hold us. Deliver us from evil, O oh Lord God. Help us not to enter into temptation, O oh Lord Jesus. Help us to live our lives for Jesus Christ that we may honor you and please you. Lord, the days are evil, but the times are in your hands. We give you thanks. We give you praise. Bless us now, O oh Lord God, as we look to you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. And Father, surely there is someone in our lives this week who doesn't know Jesus that may be on the brink of depression or suicide or danger. Help us to be there to help them this week and to tell them the great and wonderful news about our Savior and King, the King of Kings, King Jesus. We ask your blessing upon us as we part, as we go our separate ways. Hold us in the palm of your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you and greet one another this morning.